I was never a salesman. I was a graphic designer, an introverted graphic designer who liked graffiti, but I had to learn ultimately to become a salesman. So be your best salesman and get out there and just pitch constantly, not 50 times, a hundred thousand, tens of that. I probably made 10,000 unsuccessful sales pitches. And I mean that in the most literal sense. I've had 10,000 people tell me to F off when I was trying to sell them a trade show booth or sell them a t-shirt or whatever. So like that is my biggest advice. And if you do that at enough shotgun iteration and scale, you will be successful. This episode is brought to you by WeWork. Don't just work from anywhere. Your working week deserves a little luxury, like beautiful spaces to spark ideas in person. Designed carefully for collaboration and peaceful nooks with uh, focus mode and awesome Wi-Fi. I love WeWork because I'm surrounded by like-minded people. It's a great place to hang out, network, or make good friends. They're even dog-friendly. Whether you're a solo entrepreneur or you bring your entire team, yes, your entire team, uh, there's a place and a space for you at WeWork. Are you inspired by where you work? Check out WeWork. Because now you can unlock productive, flexible workspaces in over 180 locations near you, especially if you use the WeWork All Access Basic. Get 30% off your first five months by using code Brian AA30. That's B R Y A N A A three zero. Or to redeem the offer, just go to we.co forward slash behind the brand. This episode is brought to you by my brand new, absolutely free VIP list. Want to get a short note from me each week with what I've learned from interviewing some of the smartest people in the world, the best inspiration, education, access to my private events, special perks, unique finds, free stuff, and a lot more to help you improve your life and business. Get on the list. Just go to behindthebrand.tv forward slash VIP. It's an email newsletter. It's as easy as that. One, two, three, VIP, behindthebrand.tv forward slash VIP and get on the list. Hey, I'm Aaron Levant. I'm a serial entrepreneur from here in Los Angeles, and you're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the show. Aaron, welcome. Thank you for having me. Hey, I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? <laughs> um, which one? Because I've had a bunch, you know? Yeah. I've fallen uh, awkwardly into all of them. <laughs> well, I like to roll back the uh, the time clock. Let's go back to... Oh, we have history. Yeah. Um, let's roll it back maybe... Gosh, is it 15 years ago now? Maybe 10 years ago? Uh, we 2000... must have met 2009, 2010, Huntington Beach. Yeah. All right, Brian Elliott here with the Action Sports Network, and we're talking with Aaron Levant, who's president of the Agenda Show. What's up, Aaron? How you doing, man? You know, so uh, tell us about the Agenda Show and what it's all about. Um, the Agenda Show is a trade show that I started seven years ago, uh, concurrent with ASR, and uh, it's kind of grown into the premier, uh, I would say, trade show for streetwear, sneakers, and action sports uh, on the West Coast. What were you thinking about? What was young Aaron thinking about when he wanted to grow up? What did you want to be? Did you have a career path? You know, I don't know if I ever really had an idea. You know, you ask kids the question, some of the astronaut, doctor, whatever, right? You know, the stereotypical question that you ask kids. I just always knew I wanted to be in business of some kind yeah. and somewhat creative. Maybe I thought I wanted to be in movies. Maybe I thought I wanted to own a business, but I never really knew. When I was in the fourth or fifth grade, I'd published like a self-published car magazine. I was really interested in cars. So I guess I was kind of in the media business early on. I had no idea you're a car guy. Yeah, I love cars. I'm a car guy too. Yeah. yeah. I love uh, 60s and 70s American vintage muscles, like my favorite genre, but all okay. cars I love. You, you and know? Joe Rogan, muscle car guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, That's probably cool. the only thing we have in common. You know, I just saw on, uh, I think it was, I think it was TikTok or something. I saw, because I follow like a lot of these car guys on TikTok and Instagram. There's this like really amazing, like probably the cleanest 73 Pantera okay. that you've ever seen. Like wow. first owner and this, this, uh, this man's father had owned it. He was the first owner. He bought it, um, in 73. It was in his garage. He says, it's never seen rain. It was like in this immaculate garage, covered, yeah. like, you know, perfectly. That's what you're looking for. Single owner, garage cap. Oh, man. Yeah. And I was like, why is this guy selling? Because it was like this perfect, like, candy apple red. The rims are all just, it was just awesome. And he's like, to be honest with you, every time I get in, it makes me cry. I think of my dad, because his dad gifted it to him when he just passed. And he goes, I, I just can't keep it. I want to keep it, but I can't. I get in it. I just tear up every time. So it's got to go. So well, he, he sold it to this, you know, this dealer group who's going to, you know, probably find a great owner. But this thing was 
amazing <laughs> amazing yeah those cars are amazing yeah. and uh is, whether they give you the feeling or reminisce your father or you get a feeling driving it there's a certain emotion yeah. attached with cars what's yeah. your dream car then i have it it's a 1969 chevy chevelle super sport black on black oh yeah. <laughs> resto mod numbers matching never been in an accident no rust yeah okay yeah see i think that says a lot about a person you can kind of tell something about someone pretty significantly by the shoes they wear, <laughs> the car they drive. That wasn't true for me back in the day like when I was driving my little Honda Civic around. That was, that was not me. Like I was like filet mignon taste with the, like the little cheap you know, spam <laughs> budget. But yeah, you made it there. You got I the filet it. mignon to match. So you're a car guy. Okay. I'm a car guy. So yeah, I did, I did this magazine thing. Just like went to, you know, people don't even know what Kinko's is. They know what FedEx office is, but I went basically cut up all my favorite car books and other magazines and basically assembled my own car magazine, copy yeah. and paste, glue sticks, designed a cover. And I knew this is my first business transaction ever. This must've been an somewhere around the fourth or fifth grade. My neighbor was an Arby's franchisee. Okay. This guy, Walter Beck. And I walked over to his house and, you know, we were friendly with the neighbors yeah. and I brought him my magazine. I said, Hey, will you give me an Arby's ad for the back cover? Cause I knew it wouldn't be a magazine unless it had an advertisement on the back. And I got him to agree to give me the ad. And that's what made it legit. And that was my first, you know, advertising deal. I ever that was. is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, we'll put a timestamp on that. But what year is this? <sighs> Must've been, you know, 90 91 somewhere around there yeah okay yeah 91 so i mean this is pre-internet just yeah, for, yeah. for the kids watching yeah. here listening <laughs> it's this pre-social pre-internet pre-internet so glue sticks and kinkos yeah yeah you know what though so that kind of reminds me and i want to hear more of the story but uh i'll take a little left turn for a second here you remember Volcom's original advertising, or at least all surf skate snow brands? Yeah. That's what everyone was doing. They were cutting pictures out it's of punk magazines. Punk rock flyer style. Yeah. yeah. And piecing that together. Those are the good old days, man. Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, grit in a copy machine and the texture and the kind of like carbon copy aspect of it. Even fax machines. When I was a graphic designer, I used to like fax ourselves stuff and then photocopy it and then crinkle it up. This is a real like grit and texture. Now you just buy those things on the internet, like, you know, textures to put on graphics, but like we used to make that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, you know, vans back in the day, like the checkered, yeah. like Spicoli slip on <laughs> style. I mean, that's the era we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool stuff. Okay. So you got a little taste of business. You're sort of, uh, you know, right out of the womb, an entrepreneur sounds like you've got the stuff. Uh, where did that take you? Just iterating on that a hundred times. So made the car magazine, made a couple copies, sold them to my friends at school, sold them to other kids in the later nineties, 98. 798, I self taught myself Photoshop, Illustrator, Dreamweaver, and you know, all the early kind of like Photoshop creative suite programs. Yeah. Um, learned how to build websites, built a graffiti website because I was interested in graffiti, self taught graphic design, try to make a graffiti t shirt brand, try to publish graffiti videos, DVDs, and sell them through my website. And just kind of like experimented, made zines, promoted punk rock shows with my friends, you know, just did things like that. Yeah. And you're an LA guy. I'm from LA and then eventually moved out to where we both grew up, like in North of LA, you know, Thousand Oaks, Agora area. Yeah. 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 And, and that was a whole scene too. This was kind of like the, the whole groundswell for all that, whether that's well, South, South, uh, uh, it was happening in South OC with action sports. It was happening in LA in, you know, in the Valley, uh, it was kind of streetwear, graffiti, West side, not East side yeah. as much yet. Yeah. East side has really come a long way, maybe <laughs> in the last decade, but like back then East side, you didn't want to walk around. No, I used to work down there since the time, since 98, I was working in downtown LA before there was a Soho house and it wasn't the coolest place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Things have changed a little. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so what, what became of that? You started to get traction and. I, I like to talk about signals a lot because, especially for people who are trying to figure out what they want to do. And I talk about this a lot on this series. It's like, so maybe you're coming right out of high school or college. That's cool. But maybe you're like halfway done and you're thinking about resetting what you want to do. I think signals are really important. I've gotten signals throughout my life, throughout my career, but I haven't always recognized them. Um, sometimes I've bumped into them and haven't seen them. It's like, what were the signals that you were getting back then about where you should be heading. I mean, you were doing these things probably because they were in your, uh, 
wheelhouse, but you're also interested in them, maybe following trends or what people were doing, but what signals were you getting? I had almost the opposite of, of signals, which led into a signal. So, you know, without going back through the whole thing, my, my basic story is that I got thrown out of high school early on in like the first week of 10th grade. Okay. I never finished high school. I never went to college. Okay. I didn't um, know about you. And I was really, really interested in graffiti. Wait, so what happened? Can you tell <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically I did everything wrong that you could do. You broke Biting, the drinking at school, whatever. They're just like, you're out of here. You okay. Know? Was it a private school or public school? Uh, it was public school, Agora High School. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they threw me out of the whole district. So it means you couldn't even go back. Wow. Um, bad seed. Yeah. Bad seed at the time. And uh, my parents were not happy as you can imagine. Yeah. And around that time, I was really obsessed with being a great graffiti writer, which at the time, this is pre Shepard Ferry being famous. This is pre Banksy selling paintings for millions of dollars. There wasn't a real clear career path as an artist yeah. or as a business there. And, you know, I very really quickly turn to say, okay, like there's these tools, graphic design tools, video editing tools. And I learned that stuff, but I didn't quite understand how to use it. But I was better at that than I was at being an actual artist. Yeah. And Brand stuff you're talking about. Yeah. And, and one of my friends randomly was like friends with someone else through growing up in Agora and this, he was friends with this guy in downtown LA, this guy named Louis Polito, who had a streetwear company called Gat, which is where all my favorite graffiti writers coincidentally worked as graphic designers. And that clicked for me. That was the signal it was like, oh, how do you make a living doing this? I was kicked out of high school. My parents were like, what are you going to do? And I saw these guys who I looked up to not making money selling artwork, but making money working behind the computer, doing Photoshop and Illustrator, yeah. designing t-shirts. Yeah. And I got to go down and visit the warehouse and I saw what was happening there. And that was it for me. I just clicked. Yeah. And I met the guy and I just attached myself to him. And he yeah. was nice enough to say, do you want to come and help me set up our booth at the ASR trade show? This is like 1998. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what that was. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I show up at this thing and I'm just there to carry boxes, you know, and I, my lies just lit up and the signal was like, this is fucking amazing. Yeah. All this stuff. And you remember the heyday of those things. Yeah. So for people who don't know what ASR yeah. is or action sports retailer show, yeah. it's a trade show where all the surf, skate, snow companies, uh, the action sports brands come and the people who support the action sports uh, uh, industry come yeah. to basically show all their new wares. So shoe companies are there, clothing companies are there. Retailers, magazines, athletes. I mean, it was like... You know, there didn't used to be real like blogs or YouTube back then, but you'd like see magazines with like photos of these events or things. And it's like, for me, that was like, you know, everything that I've been dreaming about or reading about, like, or I'd seen in like a skate video, like happening in real life, right? Yeah. This late 90 ASR was like the peak of the industry. Skate was booming. People were booming, Yeah. you know, and it showed up there. It's like the reef girls are signing at the booth and some crazy shit's happening at the black flies booth. And there's break dancers in this corner at the tribal booth. And there's all these different subcultures emerging yeah. and all coalescing with each other. It's a really interesting place for a, you know, a, a 16 year old, 15 year old kid to be at. Yeah. It was right? popping. I mean, it was the place to be. Yeah. So I walked into that. So that's my first foray into like the industry, which coincidentally was a trade show. Yeah. And then, Oh, wait a second. Wasn't, wasn't ASR in like in Long Beach for a while? It was, we used to go back and forth every six months, Long Beach and San Diego. Oh, okay, that's so right. So it was biannual show, September and yeah. I think January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I think the first one I went to was actually in Long Beach. Yeah. And so I just walked out of that thing like, whoa. And then, then you know, this guy, Louie, liked me and I, I guess I did a good job carrying boxes and passing up flyers or whatever he wanted me to do. And I uh, was lucky enough to get an internship with him. The internship wasn't for graphic design. It was just like, clean this up, drop off this package, do this, do whatever. Yeah, just be useful. But I was so excited. Yeah. And now the thing you got to keep an eye, I was living in Agora Hills. His office was in downtown LA in the arts district. Back then it wasn't the arts district. It was just a shitty warehouse district. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't have a car because I got kicked out of high school. When you do that and you get arrested at high school, they take away your driver's license until you're 18 years old. Oh, okay. Wow. So my mom would drop, drop me from Agora Hills to Woodland Hills in the morning. Then I take the Metro Red Line bus from Woodland Hills to Universal City. Then I take the Metro Red Line train. Most people don't realize there was a subway in LA, it still is, from Universal City to to Union Station in downtown LA. Then I take another bus from Union Station to the Arts District. So wow. that's two buses, a train, and my mom every day. It's about three or four hours of transit round trip every day. Brutal. So I did that for three years. But you do what it <laughs> takes. I mean, that was kind of your only option. It's my only option. And luckily, this guy liked me. And eventually... The signal for me was, I love this. And then eventually I showed him that I know how to use the computer, which yeah. I'd been working on in my room by myself 
for no gain. And eventually he's like, okay, you can, you can help out in the design room. And that was my signal. I was like, oh, it's a foot in the door against all the stuff that I'm really hyper interested in. That's awesome. Uh, maybe it makes me think there's certain like little, uh, pivotal times when like big things are happening. Like you feel like you're right on the crest of the wave, uh, mid to late nineties for like desktop publishing is what it was called at the time. Yeah. <laughs> if you could, if you could use Photoshop illustrator, uh, the whole suite that you just mentioned, yeah. not a lot of people could do that actually. Yeah. There were people that were like old school artists who are still freehanding stuff that were like trying to convert, but still like you could be 19 or 20 something and jump into that and like learn and like be like able to do something right away. And it reminds me of what's happening right now with AI. AI is so new. Like if you are, I mean, it doesn't even matter what your age is, but if you like pivot and you jumped into that, it's sort of, it reminds me uh, of a similar kind of feeling where you're like on the cusp of something that's probably going to be big. Yeah. All these new tools, right? All the I was tools. learning to self-publish a website, learning how to edit video, doing motion graphics, right? Those were things that, you know, even just like, you know, you said you worked at, um, as a sunsport. Sunsports, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, you probably saw this. There was an era of graphic designers who were literally like cutting Ruby lists by hand to do silk screen separations. And then I learned how to do it in the computer and output my own vellum and it was el evolutions. And now I'm sure the graphic designers don't do any of that stuff, right? Yeah. They just hand over a file and some computer separates it. The skill set is evolving. I'm yeah. not evolved enough to, to uh, leverage AI yet, but yeah, like, you know, if you can leverage these new tools, you can make a career for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Those those old screen uh, printing days, the graphic design days, it's funny. It just triggered another memory. I would be over at uh, Hurley or Vulcan, wherever I was, and I'd see these designers with these old like um, books of like gas cans or gas stations with sort of that retro kind of look. Yeah, yeah. They're literally using like um, tracing paper to like, trace <laughs> around. And then they'd import that into like Illustrator and then create the lines around it. Yeah. And create, you know, a I was doing graphic. a lot of that scanning, yeah. reference, scanning, redesigning, outputting is a whole thing, which now is probably like a quarter of the time. Yeah, that's good times. Um, and so where did that lead you? So you, you got that shot. Got the shot became eventually junior graphic designer. Yeah. And in a weird way, this guy's company, um, Gat was actually downtrending. He was really successful from 89 to like the mid nineties. And at the time I met him late nineties, early two thousands. And I was just starting there. His company was actually kind of on the downtrend and, and actually he had to let some people go, which is a great opportunity for me. At first I wasn't getting paid at all. Then eventually I talked him into paying me minimum wage and which was I don't know, back then, probably five, $6 an hour. I yeah, don't know, you yeah. know, and unfortunately minimum wage didn't change too much till recently, probably but like five forty five or something, yeah, like, something that. like that. <laughs> and, uh, that was after like a year or two years that I got that. And eventually like the graphic, the head art director, graphic designer guy quit. And I just raised my hand and said like, can I have the job at the time? He's like, okay, you know, we'll see if you got the chops. And I jumped in and just started doing it. And like, I didn't have any formal training. I didn't have anything. I'd just been kind of putzing around there, like watching, looking over the guy's shoulders, self-taught. And the guy, Louis, he didn't know how to use the computer, but he was a good art director. So it was like him over my shoulder now, and I know how to use the tools. And we just started jamming. Yeah. And eventually I was, I was the main guy there. Right. And I was still, you know, this is, I'm still 16, 17 at this point. And, um, we just started going and eventually we decided to start a couple new brands together. We started a street skate brand called Matador, which had a really interesting concept, not to go far on a tangent, but you know, you talked about Volcom a few times. Our concept for our brand was like, when I grew up, like kids are really, really into Volcom. And then it goes and gets really big and they go public and kids are like, oh, that's not cool anymore. That's yeah. the evolution of brands. Yeah. You kind of become popular to then the people who help build you popularity. They have like an allergic reaction to you and they want to go to the next. Yeah. Thing they call you sellout or something. Yeah. You became too big. You're Corporate. also, yeah, you're, you're a, you're a victim to your own success. So our concept for our brand was all your favorite brands come to betray you. So our brand was going to self-destruct every four years. We're going to start a new brand. So that was the first concept for our brand. This is me and two friends in this yeah. guy, Louis, our company is called Matador. We sold it at IWS and Laguna Niguel down where you're at. Very cool. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so we started a brand and literally the idea is after four years, we just turn off the brand and start again, something new. So it never gets to that point. That's cool. Uh, that's that concept, uh, uh, our mutual friend, Seth Godin talks about scarcity a lot, yeah. <laughs> creating scarcity, uh, creating uh, demand, not, uh, trying to cater to everyone, but just trying to cater to the right people. Yep. I love that's if I can extract a business lesson, I mean, that's brilliant. Yeah. Like, we ended up shutting it down before the four years for different reasons, but you know, that was a great concept. I might want to revisit that later. Yeah. Um, timeless. Yeah. 
And then Louis had this idea. His company was called Gat, which kind of was like this like tough LA street kind of vibe. And it also had like a rave element to it. And that was kind of going out of style, but there was what was happening is this kind of emergence of the lifestyle brand. So in I think 2001, we launched a new company called Green Apple Tree, which is softer, it was more organic. The colors were browns and taupes and tans. And it was still the same letters, G-A-T, Green Apple Tree, reinvented. And he actually made me a partner in that brand with him. Right. So we launched this new brand and it worked. And it was like, we came out, Ruka came out, this brand How came out, all these new kind of new take, like arts meets lifestyle meets action sports. And they all kind of debuted at the ASR show in like 2001. And this brand kind of started to go. The Japanese retailers were picking it up. We were yeah. getting attention. We we're getting press. And we were on a little bit of a run. And we started traveling around the country, going to trade shows, going to the Magic Trade Show in Las Vegas, going to this thing called the To Be Confirmed Trade Show, um, which is kind of an indie trade show from London and New York. And I got a lot of experience traveling to trade shows. Yeah. As a, as a, first, I was doing graphics. and as a partner brand. Then I learned sales, marketing, et cetera. Yeah. And I looked around in 2002 and said, we kept going to ASR. All the other shows were getting cooler. There was like this pool show thing was happening around Vegas, around the magic show. This TBC thing was happening in New York. I said, but no, no one's doing anything at ASR. And ASR kind of didn't really understand this new lifestyle kind of elevated brand movement. And me and Louis said, why don't we go start our own trade show? And we said this in September, 2002 around ASR. Let's create the anti-ASR. Mm -hmm. And uh, at 19 years old, I said, yeah, let's do it. And I rented a Thai restaurant across the street from ASR in January of 2003 in, in Long Beach, California, and convinced 30 of our little friends who are around us at ASR who didn't want to pay $5,000 for the booth anymore. We we're going to charge $500. Yeah. So we just barely had enough money to rent the restaurant and get a couple of drinks and make yeah. some signage. And we did it. So I kind of like inadvertently transitioned from like brand to like events guy yeah. and trade show guy, just kind of just because we don't want to pay SR anymore. <laughs> yeah. The trade show business, is, it can be extremely lucrative. Uh, for people who don't know yeah. that model, what, what does it look like? So a B2B trade show is essentially, you know, as the operator, you rent out a convention center. In my case, it was a Thai restaurant. You know, <laughs> what's the difference? Uh, a space and you bring in vendors of any kind. It could be for medical equipment. It could be for skateboards. Yeah. It could be for anything. And and you bring in the brands and you bring retailers or the buyers for that industry and they transact for a couple of days and interact with each other, right? Yeah. The and, CES show, which is in Vegas, yeah. consumer electronics show, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest shows in the world. Absolutely. It's in Vegas. And then, you know, it's like a hundred thousand people show up. Yeah. Some of these shows get massive. There's yeah. shows that get bigger. Um, but it's really interesting on a pure business level, which I didn't understand this until almost now, even when I was in it until after I sold the business, I didn't understand when you're looking for a business. Now I've been in business for over 25 years now. And I think about what are, what are the elements of a good business, strong gross margin, right? Strong cash flow. Those are two of the strongest things you look for a trade show. The customers pay you net 90 means they pay you 90 days before you provide the good or service. Most businesses run into this cash flow problem where you provided the good or the service and then people pay you 30, 60, 90. Sometimes they stretch out to 120 days after. So it had a really strong gross margin. I had 70% gross margin. Yeah, you and got I got money up front is what you're saying. Yeah. So basically you start this company, you say you're going to start a show. If you can attract people, they pay you on a really strong gross before you do anything. Yeah, you pre -sell. So I never need, so I, I ran this business and I'm going to fast forward a lot for 10 years before I sold it. I never raised a dollar. I took $3,500 that I made working at GAT or Green Apple Tree, put it into this thing to rent the Thai restaurant and the business bankrolled itself to selling for a substantial amount of money. And I didn't understand what raising money was, what venture capital was, what private equity was. I didn't even know what any of that stuff meant until I sold. Yeah. Because so you didn't need it. I didn't need it because I somehow stumbled into a business that had... that was self-sustaining and cash flow positive. And yeah. like, now I can really appreciate that. And now I struggle to come up with ideas that can do that. Where I, as a young nitro kid, I happen to fall into a business that had all the makings of a great business. Yeah. Uh, give us an idea of the scale. So you started selling booth space at a, at a little restaurant for 500 bucks a pop, yeah. but like, where did it end up at its high so, point? Over 10 years, I went from selling 30 booths for $500 and then, you know, it goes, 50 booths at $700. And by the time we ended, or not we ended, by the time I sold the majority interest in the company in 2013, we probably had 2,500 clients across four shows a year. Um, I think the business was doing seven or $8 million in EBITDA per year. Um, so I forget what the gross revenue was, but like it was a really 
good business, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, booths cost around five, fifty five hundred dollars by the time, you know, we sold it. So we became the thing that we eventually, eventually somewhere in that story, we put ASR out of business, which is the funny part. Yeah. Um, and there's a few funny stories along the way where I tried to partner with them foolishly. I didn't know what I had. But tell me I, about that. I would like to hear that dirt. Uh, I would also like to know, and maybe this is another strategy thing yeah, to yeah. pull out, which is I'm thinking of it like, kind of like the, what I'd call the Burger King strategy. So McDonald's uh, is every on every corner. And so where do you put the Burger King? We well, just put it right across the street from McDonald's. So people say that about gas stations too, I think. Yeah. And a long road, you don't put it, you just put it right across. Yeah. yeah. Cause they've already done the research The you know, the top performers already, they already know where the foot traffic is. Yeah. So they've saved you all that, you know, effort and research. You just put one across the street. Where did you put agenda to ASR? Originally I put it across the street in a Thai restaurant or the closest I could yeah. get it. Yeah. So I didn't understand contracts, rules, room blocks, you know, like these big conventions, they go because they know they're bringing all this economic activity into the city and they work with the Convention and Visitors Bureau and they lock up all the hotel rooms, all the ballroom space, all the rounding facilities And the city basically agrees because this company is bringing so many people to our city, hence driving tax revenue through hotel rooms and meals and whatever, the city agrees to basically protect the event. So I had to rent a Thai restaurant because there was no you know traditional event space available. Oh, I got you. They're guarding. Yeah, they're, the, they're, the city they're and the convention of Israel Bureau helps. Yeah. And that's what, the, that's what the convention center is for, is to drive economic impact to a city. Yeah. So ASR or any large event, they're doing that. And they're driving a lot of tax revenue. Yeah. So I had to find these weird venues. Um, what was your question again? Yeah. So like, where did you oh, where did I put it? Yeah. yeah. So I put it in these, put it in the originally very obscure venues. I went from a Thai restaurant to like a small wedding and like bar mitzvah venue yeah. to a, to an abandoned parking lot. Was literally. it the same city though? This is all, Long Beach I started in Long Beach yeah. and then ASR stayed in San Diego for many years. Yeah. And then in San Diego, I was just popping around the gaslight district, like finding like literally the, as I grew, I went from literal restaurant to like obscure wedding venue on the back of a restaurant to, to this literally an abandoned parking lot. Like yeah. not joking, like a, like a parking lot where I had to pay to clean up like toxic waste and like barrels of oil and like yeah. all this stuff. Um, I tried to build a tent, ASR tried to stop me. And how we got on this, you asked me like, as I was having this trouble with these venues, I didn't realize what I was building was a business because I was still in the clothing business. And I just started this events company as almost like a side hustle because we didn't want to pay the $5,000 to go over there. We're still small. And I literally called up ASR because I didn't understand business at this point. I'm still sub 20 years old. Yeah. No college, no business experience. And I called up, I just rang up the phone. Hey, so-and-so ASR said, can I, I said, I was having a hard time getting space. I said, can I just rent space at your show in bulk on a discount? I said, I have this little show with cool brands. I said, can I just have like floor space? And they're like, piss off kid. Like, get out of here. What are you talking about? And the guy said, no. And I said, all right, I kept doing it. And the thing kept getting bigger. And I was like, this is really a burden to get space. And I literally went to the website of the company that owns ASR. And I called the parent company. I said, hey, like VNU Expo, which is now Nielsen Business Meet. I said, I'm like this guy that has a show across the Can I just rent space from you at a bulk discount? And they told me to go F myself again. And I kept trying. I literally tried <laughs> to give them the show yeah. on multiple occasions because yeah. I had just had no idea what I had. You could bring all the cool people. and Yeah. I, cool I thought people. I had a good value proposition. I'm like, I'll pay for space. Yeah. And they, they just did. They just like, they saw, they understood that I was competition. They didn't want to help me. But we, uh, the, I'll pause you <laughs> for a second. The real value to them was the authenticity, the street cred and the people that you brought Yeah, because their show was no longer cool. They didn't see that though. But what I'm saying, yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. like, that's the lesson like yeah. embedded, like for someone else who's listening, it's like, that's the opportunity to help them see the real value. Yeah. It wasn't just like, you know, the low hanging fruit. Sure. Yeah. They could make a buck or two from the space that you would yeah. rent, but like, that's not the real value. They didn't want either. Right. Yeah. And and, you know, I didn't realize I was solving a problem. I mean, all the things you think about, not just I said they're good about the business, about like the gross margin and the cash flow. My business was solving a problem. There's all these cool up and coming brands who wanted somewhere to be that was more authentic, more like-minded and cheaper. Yeah. So I solved this problem inadvertently. And then I tried to give away this great mousetrap I created. And by them rejecting me trying to give it away for multiple years in a row, I didn't just try once. I was like running into that wall over and over again. I said, fine, let's keep going. Yeah. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger organically, you know, but not like by... You know, it took 10 years, but it just inching, inching, inching forward. And all of a sudden it turned over and it was pretty big. Right. And yeah. like, and then they tried to buy it <laughs> and then they offered me like $200,000. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> like something like, and that's when I was smart enough to go, oh, no, 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 no. That's yeah. not happening. <laughs> yeah. You should look, look at our uh, booth sales for at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. Um, 
And so did you eventually find a full size venue for it? I mean, so this is, this is probably the most interesting. If I had a business case study, this would be it. <laughs> so right around the time we met 2009, ASR had, after they tried to buy us for cheap and me and my cousin owned the company hundred percent, we wouldn't sell. They basically got so gangster. They said, we're going to squeeze these guys out. So they went, they already had the lock on all the big traditional spaces. We had somehow squeezed into this one old like building convention center that had like been a few blocks away that somehow they didn't have a contract over and we squeezed in. Yeah. And my cousin forgot to re-sign our, our lease our like, we signed multiple year leases out and we was on like a two, you know, we've been doing this for years now and he forgot to re-sign our, our renegotiation lease like by a week and they snuck in and signed it. Mm -hmm. And they basically squeezed us out of having a space. Yeah. And, and they squeeze, they rented all the parking lots. So we couldn't build a tent. They basically squeezed us out of the city. Yeah. And that was when we were doing well. Cock block. They, they cock block the shit out of us. Yeah. Yeah. And we said, shit, like our whole business while we're big is we're like the little fish that sucks onto a shark. You seen those? Yeah. We were this little thing while we were bigger than we were. We weren't anywhere near as big as them. And we said, we're no longer able to suck onto the shark. So we got to leave and go on our own. Is that going to work? And the whole cost structure is based on everyone's coming into town and then they come and stop by us. Right. So we're forced to say, are we going to go somewhere else? Are we going to give up? Are we going to go sell to them for nothing? And randomly around that time, I walked into Hurley of all places. Mm -hmm. My friend, I was just driving around Orange County, going to see customers. And I meet this guy, Paul Gomez and Roger Wyatt, who at that time was the CEO of Hurley. And they tell me at that time, they were going to become, I think it was Quicksilver or OP or one of the brands. They were to come to the sponsor of the U.S. Open of Surfing in Huntington Beach that summer, yeah. summer 2009. Yeah. It's the first year they were going to take it over and they were going to reinvent the U.S. Open of Surfing, which for people to know is the biggest action sports event in the world that usually draws 500,000 people to the beach over the course of yeah, the summer. Yeah, there's like music, there's skateboarding, yeah. there's like, uh, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. And they said, we want to do that. And they said, why don't you bring Agenda from being down there in San Diego and put it in the middle of our event and put it at the Huntington Beach Hyatt across the street and we'll bring all the retailers into town. And if you do that, we'll bring Hurley and Nike and Converse with you mm -hmm. and we'll leave ASR and we'll come with you. The anchors. And they didn't know at that time that I was checkmated, I was done. And I said, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and we did that that summer. And not only was it amazing, but it also, because it was in July rather than September, there was this whole thing around the cycle of when the brands would be selling product in the cycles of manufacturing and the pre-sale calendar it was actually way more conducive for business. So we took something and we pulled away from the thing that we were sucking off of to gain life. And we went somewhere else. We created actually an even better business model. It was more exciting. People then go across the street and go to the surfing contest. Oh yeah. There's all this stuff. And we literally, after their, they were in business, I think 37 years ASR, within six months, they closed up shop. Yeah. And all the brands went and came with us. And we literally, it was like a judo throw. Yeah. We went from like uh, back against the wall dead to like putting them out of business in a six month period. That's incredible. Yeah. I had no idea that backstory. Yeah. And that venue too, that, that hotel right there in Huntington, literally you walk across the street and you're on the sand. You have a big glass window. You're in a, usually in a convention center. It's like a, just a big warehouse, right? With a high ceiling that you can yeah. like rig stuff from. This was a ballroom they usually do weddings at, and it literally has glass window overlooking the beach. Yeah. So people are out there. We had a barbecue. It was just cool, like yeah. great vibe. Yeah, and then vibe, yeah. you walk across the street and the biggest surf contest in the world is happening. And yeah. like, you know, you're, you're selling surf culture. Well, there's Kelly Slater, you know, winning a contest, right? Like it went from like talking about it to being about it. You're in Surf City, USA. Yeah. So, you know, it was really interesting. And then, you know, we weren't so surfy, right? We were more street and skate. And all of a sudden we became the biggest action sports show in the world, like overnight. So it was, it was a whole interesting paradigm shift. Yeah. And it would attract international too. You'd have people from Europe. All over the Japan. world flying into the show. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So... So what, what lessons did you extract from that? I mean, uh, how, <laughs> um, what's the percentage of luck and skill there? I would always say luck, right? But it's like, what I find myself doing, even, even to this day is like when I'm, when I'm feeling like, uh, back against the wall or whatever, I'm like, I get out there and I talk to people. So like the, the, the value of meeting people and talking and building relationships, like I didn't have a meeting at Hurley that day, but I just went around. I would just always go to Orange County and just show up at everyone's office. And I was doing that for 10 years and the value of building relationships and talking to people and just sharing something will come out of that. Right. And yes. my whole business was built on the value of face-to-face -face connection. Yes. Yeah, you could email someone in order, but it's not the same as going and doing this. Right. And, and I think, 
the value of face-to-face -face connection, the value of showing up in person is always going to have an exponential value. And there's a lot of luck involved that there was that opportunity that they happen to be sponsoring the US Open of Surfing that year. But also when your back is against the wall, take the big leap. Cause like we could have just, you know, folded up shop, yeah. but I kept trying and kept thinking, and I didn't fold up shop. My cousin, a few times, I'm pretty sure he said, let's just give up and cut our losses and take our winnings and go home, you know, but I wasn't going to give up. And ultimately like not giving up and continue to just go out there and put on the, you know, smiley face, pretend like everything was all good. It, it, it worked out. Right. So you got to push through the point of what on paper was, we were dead. It was failure. I love that lesson. And yeah, a few it, lessons in there. <laughs> yeah. It, it reminds me of you, a few things like just when you think, I mean, I just started, uh, BJJ, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I'm learning is when you think you're totally gassed, when you, yeah. you've got no more in the tank, you've actually got probably like 30% more. <laughs> you just think I'm done. You want to submit. Yeah. You got 30% more. So just hang in there. Yeah. I think pushing through the point of failure in all scenarios, like most people give up. Right. And like what yes. I, all the stuff I didn't know about business, like people are like, Oh, what's your burn rate? What's your, this you get to on paper, there's a point where you get to zero, right? And you're like, okay, that's it. We're bankrupt. We're folding it up. All logical answers. If you can somehow mentally or physically pass the point of we're done, that's actually where you find the most success. And I think it's the easiest way to boil it down. I would co-sign that because I've been there several <laughs> times uh, in the last, you know, decade plus uh, weathering storms and whatnot. Yeah. For sure. And it's almost like in those moments, you have no other choice but to get creative uh, and scrappy, almost desperate sometimes. Just like, I got to fucking pay the rent. I got to yeah. make this work. So I got to figure something out. Yeah. Being uncomfortable is where your best work comes from. I love that. Okay. So you sold the show in 2013. Where did that take you? I sold the show to a company called Reed Exhibitions, biggest trade show company in the world in 2013, um, for a decent amount of money, more money than a 29 year old kid should have had. And I could have, you know, I, can you give us like, uh, was it seven figures, eight figures, nine figures? I'll tell you, I sold, I sold the show for $40 million. Amazing. Um, and it was a great outcome because again, going to pure business lessons and I didn't know any of this stuff. And that's just you and your cousin. Me and my cousin owned hundred percent of the company. We raised zero dollars in venture capital. Awesome. We had zero investors. We had zero debt. We had zero lines of credit. So, you know, now I understand in the world we're raising money, this concept of dilution, right? Most people go out and raise money. They don't own their whole company. Now it's great to have that venture capital and have those things to help you grow. But yeah. we had this rare business where we controlled a hundred percent of the company. So what I want to know is yeah. what does your mom say? <laughs> I guess getting kicked out of high school isn't so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or did she say, you know, I always knew you would amount to something, you know? Yeah. There was a lot of questions along the way, but by the time I sold it, everyone saw that I was on a path to success. Yeah. But there were a few years there in the beginning when I was doing graffiti and building a graffiti website and doing graphic design and driving to downtown LA, you know, of course everyone's like, what, what the fuck is he doing? Right. Yeah. And it all worked out in the end, but it was all based off of my interest in hip hop, street culture, graffiti, design, art, you know, skateboarding culture, all those things that eventually ended up in this thing. It was my authenticity and understanding of those spaces and why I was successful. We yeah. didn't talk a lot like why did agenda work versus ASR or whatever. And there was that big judo move at the end, but the brand and the culture and the cult that we built at agenda was all based off of my authentic interest in culture and building a business around stuff I could authentically speak about. Yeah. And I was at the time I was going and pitching brands. If you're a Volcom across the table for me, I was the age of the core demo, the consumer, rather than some suit from ASR telling you come and get in front of your demo. Right. So all that stuff equals so my mom, got on the boat and they, my parents are extremely supportive, right? There yeah. was a few moments they doubted me, but at 99% of the time they were behind me. Yeah. Well, I just want to extract a lesson too for parents. It's yeah. like, you know, invest in your kid and, you know, try to give them all the resources. I mean, I'm just boiling this down to the least common denominator, which is she freaking put you in a car and got you to yeah. the train station. And that's what you needed at the time. And then you, you took it home. You brought it home. You yeah. did all the rest. If you see your kid, you know, I was what was whatever, by all means, a juvenile delinquent. I was headed on the wrong path. But when I finally, no one could tell me, no principal, no teacher, no family member, no parent could try to guide me. But once I found that thing I clicked with, if you see your kid click with something, push them in that direction and encourage them. Yeah. So that's what I got. I, I had to ultimately find that thing, but then they enabled me to keep going with that. Yeah. Rather than saying, go back to school and become a lawyer or, or whatever. give up yeah. on them. Like, oh, you're a degenerate. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, you're shaming the family. Like, no, like 
double down on your kid, invest in him, give him tools, and then absolutely. he's got to do the work. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Okay. So $40 million, then you parlayed <laughs> that into? You know, so I I could have walked away and I'd never, by the way, by the time I sold it, I didn't know what a P&L was until I sold the company. Literally, I didn't know what a profit and loss statement was. I didn't understand gross margin. I didn't understand those things. And going through the process of selling the company, we hired an investment bank. Like I'd never even seen my business. Like they, they take your business, and they put it into a presentation yeah. and then they go show it to buyers and managers. So I learned more about in that last six months of selling the business than I learned in the last decade before of course. that. So it's you and your cousin, but did you have like an accountant? Like what was your team? Was it less than five? I mean, how many people on that Probably team? by the time we sold it, it might've been 13 people. Okay. But, um, Sales small people, team, yeah. respectively, and you I gave him half the company in the third year because he knew how to use Excel and QuickBooks and I didn't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so he was like the business ops guy and I was like the brand sales visionary. visionary guy, yeah. Right. Yeah. So where you say where I parlayed from there. So I decided to stay on and run the company at the new parent company. And I had a bigger vision. My cousin exited at that point and I always wanted to do more. I had a big vision. So I said, okay. But it was always our money because we didn't have investors. It was like all the risk was on us. We we're very conservative, right? We actually grew the business quite slowly. And I said, okay, well, these guys are the biggest trade show company in the world. They're worth $7 billion. I said, why don't I take their money and actually go do all the things I wanted to do? So then I took agenda from the four events we sold them and I expanded it to over 30 events over the next five years. I launched events. I acquired events. I started new events. I started this event, Complex Con, which is kind of like Comic Con for yeah. sneakerheads. I remember. I didn't know that was your. Yeah. So that, I did that cool. all through the the infrastructure and the capital of the new company. So I basically stayed there and then climbed the corporate ladder. I started as the general manager of Agenda. Then I became the group vice president, the SVP, started working on corp dev and learning the inner workings of a publicly traded company. So I basically got my business MBA over the next five years, working inside their company, learning and really learning how companies work, really yeah. learning. And I think I got more dangerous, meaning in a good way, like effective at being an actual business leader and learning how to work not for myself in a little dictatorship, but I had, to, I had to report up to someone. I had to answer to someone yeah. and I had to lead large teams down, had to just learn the whole skill set, right? So that was a really eye-opening and a valuable experience for me. And I did some fun stuff like launch ComplexCon. Yeah, that's relatable. I got the same kind of experience when I worked at the studios. Yeah. It was a, you know, big boy job and you know, I had <laughs> the a big, big boy job, yeah. big budget and I was accountable, yep. you know, for, for a lot of money. So that makes sense. That resonates with me. I, I also discovered working at a big company that my style my lack of traditional training was a value because I was almost like entrepreneur in residence. Yeah. That all the people that worked there, you know, worked there for 20 years and they started in the, whatever the sales position and they worked their way up over 20 years of being, and they had a very regimented way of thinking and my coloring outside the lines. Cause I didn't know the rules and the playbook and the politics. I just did shit. And they were like, Whoa, you're just going to do that. And they yeah. worked They're like shocked, but then they loved me for it. Right. So it was, it was a good learning and also learning that my wild style was, was also an, uh, an asset in corporate America versus a detriment to a certain extent. Yeah. I love that. I think, um, that's certain, that sort of guerrilla mentality, just like do whatever it takes to get it done. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's how we beat the British and, and you know, won the <laughs> revolutionary war, they tell me, but, um, it makes sense. And, and I can also relate with that, right? Because having worked on the client side of a big corporation, I worked in that, you know, monolith tower there, you know, um, off the 101 freeway, if you know where the universal of course. NBC tower is, I was on the 15th floor and then on the 32nd floor, it's super corporate in structure. But when I started my own company, it was like, all bets are off. There's no more rules. Uh, we make the rules, we break the rules, we're yeah. the hero, but also we're at fault. And I, I wondered looking back on those days, how I spent so much time just like in meetings Meetings about meetings and, and thinking it's like, it's like, how do you get shit done? Like I, when I, you're working for yourself, like every minute counts and you're super efficient and you're just like, you you're know, doing shit. You're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you got to get it done to get the next thing done, to move the, to move the, uh, the rock up the hill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. All companies are better if people just did shit. <laughs> yes. So what do you think gets people stuck? Whether they're, you know, working for themselves or on the corporate side. What, what prevents us from doing cool shit? It all depends on the person. I would say, and I hate to lump anyone in. There's always exceptions to the rule. There's always that person that's super effective in corporate America or a super scrappy entrepreneur. But let's just lump majority of people in business into just, you know, the, the mass majority of how they're, 
you know, they go through a system. They were, they went to school, they colored inside the lines, they went to college, they learn their degree. Then they got in a job, just like the people I described. And none of them are bad people. None of them are not smart people, but they, they subscribe to the path, the, 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 the common path, yeah. you know, you start an X role and then you work your way up and you go from, you know, manager to senior manager to director to da, 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 da. And there's like these little boxes that the world puts you in status quo and, yeah. and, 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 and the hierarchy systems that we all subscribe to. And it's like, oh, this intern's not allowed to walk into the meeting and tell the CEO X. Right. Yeah. And like, you know, the people that are really hyper successful, you know, um, learn that they can just. I hate to use color outside the lines is such an overused analogy, but like literally the people just break the rules and can, and think for themselves and don't subscribe to that and are willing to, to have lose that job or have people be mad at them or the most successful is like Steve job is a pretty powerful quote somewhere when he's like, when you realize you can poke life and like I the exact words he used and you can you manipulate it and it'll change around you. The second you realize that opposed to just living inside of it, that's, that's when you become really successful and you have that level of awareness. So yeah. somehow, because I didn't come from that system, I was able to do that. But I think most people get caught in, in the system from, you know, the matrix, if you will. Right. And yeah. I think most people are scared to, to break the, the wall of the rules or the way of being. Yeah. I heard the saying, it's like, the most dangerous set of words is we've always done it like this. Yeah. And you know, if, if it's, if it's working great, but like usually there's a better way to, to do it. Yeah. More efficient, you know, updated, whatever. So it has to do with the financial system as well. Like you don't want to break the rules here because then you can't pay your rent, your credit card bill, your car bill, da, da, da. So because you're running on the financial hamster wheel and most people, you know, don't have a significant reserve of savings or a cushion, they don't want to rock the boat over here because they can't afford to rock the boat here. So like most of the time I was breaking all the rules, I was living in my parents' house, living in my parents' house. I was 23 years old. So in a way that financial stability of living at home allow me to just try and do shit, you know? Yeah. So I think that's a, an, un, you know, most people now are back living in their parents' house, so they should try more things. <laughs> yeah. Good advice. Okay. So then bring us up to speed. So yeah. what happened then? So I stayed there. I had a three year earn out and earn out for those of you guys who know, it's like company buys your business. They buy 85% up front and they agree to pay you more on the back end to basically keep you there and keep continuity. So I actually stayed for five years, okay. two years past the time because I enjoyed what I was doing so much. Yeah. I was learning so much. You're growing the business. I'm sure. Growing the business. I grew 80% the first year I was there. The complex con launch was a huge thing for me. Just like thing I'm most passionate about. I started this thing called the merge, which is kind of like a TED talk for like creative industry. You might have gone to one of those. Um, so I was having a great time. And what I did is did that. And then eventually I said, All right, five years, two years past the mark that I was supposed to stay. I've done my duty here. I was ready to try something new. And I actually went out and started a new business with a friend of mine. And I was gonna go and work on that, which was I saw the cannabis industry really, you know, legalization, all this stuff. So we started the first really cool B2B trade show for cannabis called Hall of Flowers in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and got that off the ground with another friend of mine from the trade show industry. And I was going to go work on that. Same year, I uh, partnered with a couple friends and backed them financially and with my resources. And uh, we started a hot sauce company called Truff. Cool. Um, which some of you guys may know, my, 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 my friends, Nick and Nick are co-CEOs of that and really visionaries behind it. And both those businesses were primed and I was ready to work on that and some other stuff. And it was 2017 in ComplexCon and I was thinking about those. And that was honestly the direction I was going in. So these two new entities, I was ready to reel off this, maybe just become a consultant, figure out what my next thing was going to be. Yeah, you're incubating new ideas. Yeah. And those were the going. And Mark Echo, who's the founder of Complex Media, who I did um, prolific entrepreneurs on right. Probably my main person that I look up to. Yeah. Big deal. 2017, September, he calls me, he says, Hey, will you meet with Jimmy Iovine? Okay. And I said, of course, I just watched the defiant ones documentary on HBO. Like, you know, literally I just learned so much about it. And I said, of course, I didn't know what it was about. And he sets me up at this meeting and I show up at this office and he's at the CEO of Apple music at the time. And he's got this crazy office in Culver city, the Apple beats headquarters. And I walk in and Long story short, he essentially says, you know, we're working on QVC meets Comic-Con. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Tell mm -hmm. me more. And we have this meeting that I think is kind of uneventful, but I, I understood the core of what he was talking about. And his son, Jamie, who's now my partner now, had come up with this idea and they were incubating it, working on it. At the time it was called Meltdown. It was a comic book store in Hollywood. And they wanted to create the QVC for millennial Gen Z audience, right? And I went home that night 
and I had no intention of working there, but he didn't necessarily was trying to hire me, but I went home that night and I drew up a business plan for him. Okay. And I sent it to him at three in the morning and I said, thanks for the time. I heard your rough idea. And I said, I think this is what you were trying to say to me, but articulated in a business plan. Cause I speak deck yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't hear back from him for, I don't know, two, three weeks. I was like, oh, I guess he didn't like me. And I, didn't, I didn't feel that he liked me at that meeting. Oh yeah. And Wait, so you had no follow up between that time. You just no follow up. Sent- I sent, I sent, I spent like all night working on this deck yeah. and just nothing. It just, it's, you know, echoes. You just, feel like ascend into the abyss. I just, I went back, ran the complex con again. And I was, you know, I was fancying on resigning at the beginning of the new year. Yeah. I got hot sauce. I got other things going. Yeah. I got things going and you know, I was doing all right. And, um, this business manager calls me. And he goes, hey, look, we never heard back from you. And I said, well, I sent Jimmy an email. By the way, Jimmy's email address was jimmy at apple.com. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great email address. <laughs> <laughs> he told me the email address we were walking out, like I could remember it. And I was like, I just emailed jimmy at apple.com this email. And I never heard back. And I was, thought maybe he never got it or he was joking about the email address. And the business manager goes, oh, we never heard back from you. Like, what happened? Hmm. And I said, oh, I sent Jimmy this deck. He goes, oh, Jimmy doesn't check his emails. And he goes, send it to me. I sent it to him. And they, they call me back within one day. They go, this is amazing. Can you come back in and meet with us? And they're like, oh, he never got the email. He doesn't look at his emails. And, and, and we have this amazing meeting and they're like, they're like, will you help us find a CEO for this business? And I started introducing them to people and will you consult with us? And I was still doing the thing. And eventually they're like, well, why don't you do it? Yeah. I'm like, well, I was coming up with reasons. So I got this thing. I just started this other company. I'm working on this events company. I'm still running this complex con thing. And I just got to know these guys. And then I realized one of those things when you're offered a rocket ride on a rocket ship, you yeah. say yes. Yeah. You feel it. Yeah. You say yes. Right. And I, I really just mustered up the strength to go in to read exhibitions where they've been great to me. And I built an amazing thing and I spent, you know, 15, it was a 15 year mark exactly of when I started agenda to the time I left. Right. And on the eve of the 15th anniversary, I said, I quit. I'm retiring from the trade show business. And I decided to go work on incubating this new company, which is now called Network, which is a live stream video shopping platform where I'm CEO today. We've been doing it for almost five years now. And um, that's what I've been spending the majority of my my energy working on. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, there's so much there I want to unpack. <laughs> um, I mean, again, let's go back to, you know, yeah. where this uh, opportunity and luck and uh preparation this intersection all kind of meet yeah. it's like you were ready now uh, you'd you'd put in the work you you know you knew what you were doing uh you in proximity of the right people and the opportunities for that to sort of come and present itself to you but it was happens this meeting was like unexpected i didn't even know what it was about when i walked in the room i was just like of course i'll meet there's no context given sure and much like that meeting going, walking into Hurley that day and them saying, Hey, we're going to the U S open and me having the guts to say, yeah, let's go. Like say, I feel like the same, those two moments are two pivotal moments in my career, which is like someone else had this like thing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with that energy. So those were two very important decisions to say yes at those two key periods. Yeah. So it's almost like, I mean, in my experience, tell me if you're different, a lot of people I meet and I present things to the default answer is no. In <laughs> fact, in fact, now I just remembered, uh, I was on a, I was on a big team. I was a small little cog in a wheel on the, uh, at universal in the acquisition team, you'd sit in a room with 20 people and, and these properties would come in. I remember like a, there's a lion gates, lion's gate movie called, uh, was it the piano? <laughs> I think so. Anyway. Um, and we'd say, Oh yeah, we want that. Or no, we don't want that. And, and most people would just say no, because they thought that was the right thing to do. You're almost saying like, the answer is yes, what's the question? <laughs> the answer is yes, to take the meeting. What if, and again, like, of course, when someone says you want to meet with someone super important and influential, but like, I try to take a lot of meetings and most people are like, oh, I'm busy. I need to focus. But like, again, like going back to that ideology, like meeting with people, um, it was very easy for me not to come here today or do something. It's just like, it's, it's always some value comes out of it. And it's like, you know, people are so precious about their time. Of course I need to be focused and execute my tasks and be with my team and whatever, but there's a lot of value just getting out and meeting and talking to people and engaging and sharing ideas. And like, maybe something doesn't come out of it even 90% of the time, but the 10 or even 1% that it does, if I wouldn't have taken those 10 meetings, I wouldn't have got to that one where like this exponential life value, career value, financial value will come out of. So I'm a very big fan of just like mixing it up with people. 
And that was kind of the basis of an agenda, like people coming together, meeting, building value, building relationships. So I think not being so precious about meeting with people. A lot of people, I try to get in touch with successful people my whole career as a salesperson selling t-shirts or trade show booths or whatever. Most people won't even talk to you. It's just like wall up. And like, it's really hard to get your foot in the door. I'm always trying to be opposite. Like I'm somewhat easy to get a hold of. Maybe I've been accused of being too accessible because I see the value in it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Again, lots of good lessons. Just about sort of the right definition of hustle, you know, just moving your bones. Um, being open, it seems like, and, you know, going back to Seth, Seth gave me this advice many times where he said, the person that you think can help you is not that person. You know, she doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about you. It's the person you probably least expect that we can find these opportunities. And maybe it's like a, it's a leapfrog thing where it's like, you want to get to that big name. Um, in order to get to her, you've got to go through these guys and then maybe you can get that introduction, but it goes back to relationships. Like, Everything and nothing has changed. It's still about pressing the flesh, getting to know people, you know, building trust, uh, building friendships, and then, you know, again, staying active, keeping your head on that swivel, looking around for these opportunities. Yes. And I think there's another thing in there, specific in my meeting with Jimmy and and a bunch of other ways, the way I operate. And Gary V talks about this a lot. Some people do or don't like Gary. I love, I love Gary. Yeah. Gary and our buddies. Yeah. He's great. Um, You know, so some people talk about their ideas and their stuff being too precious. I try not to be very precious. I'll, like I went home with some guy who clearly, if I would have asked him, say, give me a hundred thousand dollars to write this business plan, he probably would have said yes. But I didn't even think about that. I just thought, oh, this is, what, a, what a nice guy. I was a pleasure to meet him. I went home and put all this work in this thing and sent it to him. I'm an expert. I could charge for my time. I could consult. I could do this stuff. I don't think like that. I was like, yeah, here you go. Giving away your value yeah. as like, that's your value, your foot in the door. And I think Gary talks about this, like the ideas aren't precious. The execution is hard, right? Yeah. So it's like, I wrote some crazy business plan. Who's crazy enough to go do this business plan? That's the harder part, you know? So like I meet with people sometimes and I like ask them a question. I'm like, oh, like you gotta, some of people literally said to me, like, you gotta pay me for my opinion. Are you gonna pay me for this? And I'm like, I understand if that's what you do, you're a consultant, all you get is pay for your time. But if it's having a casual conversation, I ask you like, who are your favorite fashion designer or something? And someone's like, oh, you gotta pay me to tell you that. I'm like, yeah. I, I never insulted. I respect however someone makes money, but I'm a little bit put off. Cause then like, like, okay, I see your demeanor. And like, my demeanor has always been like, give away my value. If anyone asks me a question, some entrepreneur asked me how to do something. They ask for a contact, for a source, for an opinion. I go, I go much further. I'll give them all that and I'll help them do the work. And I don't expect anything. And I think it comes back to me when I give it away. And it's not because I'm thinking strategically, I'm going to give away and hope it comes back to this. Give it away and like whatever happens, happens. And it tends to come back to me. Yeah. Your idea is not that great. <laughs> uh, someone's probably already thought of it. Or even if you just tell it to me, it's not that top as top secret as you think it is. Yeah. Unless it's some like super intricate, uh, tricky yeah. uh, patent. We're not, we're not product. doing like biotechnology over here and you've got the new CRISPR thing. We're, you know, we're selling yeah. t-shirts. Recipe to Coke, <laughs> Coca-Cola or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, which I think is out there on the internet somewhere. Yeah. By the way, it reminds me, have you seen... So uh, I have my finger on the pulse of socials just because I love pop yeah. culture and I love to see what's happening. But there's this guy on TikTok who says he's like the um, president of the fast food club. Have oh, you I seen, this, seen guy? this guy? No. Oh, he's amazing. He does this thing. I think his name is Jordan. And he has this shtick where he's like, hey, come here, come closer. And like, there's a zoom in. Yeah. And he like tells you all these secrets. And like, so oh, I have seen that guy. He talks about like the in and out menu. And yeah, the, I have seen that guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so like every other post is like these mind blowing secrets that he knows somehow <laughs> of like the, uh, Kentucky fried chickens, yeah. 11 herbs and spices. He'll go, no one knows this except me. Here we go. <laughs> like He just <laughs> rattles it off. <laughs> it's, uh, how, how much are you paying attention to uh, subcultures or pop cultures these days, like on social? Is TikTok a thing for you? I deleted TikTok from my phone probably within a month of getting it on my phone, only because it's distracting to me. And I have a hard time because it is addictive and I'm not saying it's addictive in a good or bad way, but it pulls me in so tight. So I had to literally get off my phone. Yeah. I have YouTube shorts and Instagram reels. I deleted Instagram from my phone in the last three months. Yeah. Uh, I put just Instagram on my iPad because people use Instagram as a messaging platform. So I need to check it, but I don't, I can't get into the content. The one social media platform I have, I don't know if it's a social platform is YouTube. So between YouTube shorts and the actual long form videos, watching stuff like yours, I'm really into business podcasts, 
your stuff all in. You know, if you follow that one, Absolutely. you know, I'm really into that type of content. All those guys. Yeah. Like that stuff's really intriguing to me. Long Shaman. form in-depth business content, but the short form stuff just can kill hours of my day unintentional. So yeah. I'm following as much as I can, but with, I still have to work. And because I wear many hats and have a big team, like I cannot get too far deep. So I'm probably less connected than I've been in a long time, but I'm getting more shit done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the distribution plan and, and like, how are you marketing your current business? Like, how are you getting the word out? Talk to us about like the, the marketing. What does that look like? What's yeah. the model? So for network, it's a, it's a marketplace and a platform. Yeah. Think of it like a marketplace so like StockX meets Instagram Live. So it's a dynamic living marketplace with all these culturally relevant products and talent and influencers and sellers and resellers all going live. And, you know, yeah. QVC meets Gen Z, you yeah. know, meets ComplexCon, It's right? a cool QVC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we market it in many ways. We, you know, of course, do the traditional paid advertisements. Wait, so you know, is it on TV? It's on our own platform, web and iOS and Android app. So it's not, um, uh, it's not on network TV? No, okay. it's not on TV. Like later... There could be, but really there's no more linear TV. It could be a smart TV app, if you will. Yeah. But there's isn't really native integrated payments where you can do one click checkout on a smart TV yet, right? Soon that will come, but we're not quite there yet. Spell it out for, since this is also going to be an audio form. Yeah. Where can people find it? You just go to the ntwrk.com. So it's like network with no vowels or you just search ntwrk in the Apple app store. That's really the best experience is on our native iOS or Android app. And, um, you know, we have our own standalone platform and, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, some people want us to publish on TikTok or on YouTube or on these popular social platforms, but I've, I'm old enough now. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough now where I've seen many waves of social platforms and video platforms come and go. So at one point, you know, in the early agenda days, I had a great presence on MySpace. Yeah. What does that mean now? Right. So these platforms, you know, what was Facebook was hot, Instagram was hot, TikTok's hot. Now I don't know, Lemon 8 is hot. All these things yeah. happen. So I don't want to invest too much in building an audience and a credibility somewhere that, that I don't control. So we've chose to have a smaller audience in our own platform. We have a direct connectivity with the customer. Yeah. What does it mean? You asked, it means you're renting, you don't own yeah. and anyone could, you know, uh, evict you at any moment. Two, three things can happen. You can be evicted which happens. There's popular creators on Twitch who say the wrong thing and they're literally just taken off the deplatformed, right? People deplatform for good reasons and bad reasons, but you know, literally you can be just deplatformed. That's a risk. You can't build your business on someone else's platform you don't own, right? That's why things like Substack and these things are you know growing because you can have a direct monetary relationship with your customer. Um, platform can lose popularity. So I don't know, at one point, Tila Tequila was the hottest person <laughs> on MySpace. Where is she now, right? Yeah. Some people transcend platform to platform, but a lot of people don't. They're, they were a Vine. I heard someone said to me yesterday, like, this guy was really popular on Vine. I'm like, what does that mean now, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the last thing that can happen is is actually the most common, which is the platform decides, because they're a publicly traded company, they need to make more money. So they start charging you to reach your own audience, which is really what we're all in. Unless you pay Instagram. Yeah. To get past the algorithm, you are literally going to be seen by one tenth of your organic audience. People who choose to follow you will not see you unless you pay the vig, right? On YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok. So once the platform gets past that organic growth stage, they need to squeeze more juice out of that lemon. So I don't want to be paying the toll to see the people who even organically chose to follow me, yeah. right? And that's a real challenge. That's really the, the scaling challenge that all brands are going to have with all social and video platforms. Yeah. And we're seeing it. It's tempting, right? Because TikTok is popular today, yeah. but like TikTok is, did, it did what Instagram did. It opened the floodgates. Yeah. It kind of gave you that first little bit of crack. Yeah. You got addicted and you Fast started- growth. Yeah. You remember when people used to get on the, on the, like the popular page on Instagram and it's like, everyone would see you now you got to pay for that, right? Yeah. And- <laughs> One thing to remember is that you're, you're not the customer, you're the product, right? Yeah. So like they don't exist if you don't create content. You're seeing that revolt happen on Reddit right now. Yeah. The mods. Yeah. 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 Um, absolutely. And, and, uh, your, your point is great. And like, there's just, that's why we chose to basically build our own, our yeah. own, our own platform. So it goes very expensive. <laughs> yeah. But you know, again, it's that you're building for the long term. Um, so I go to network and I want to shop for whatever are there is it like QVC like hey this week's hot item is this there's live streams from sellers selling everything from sneakers collectible toys vinyl records art streetwear and apparel vintage trading cards, Pokemon cards, baseball cards, et cetera. So there's all these different genres. And if I've got something to sell, can I join network as a partner? 
you're not, it's not a, it's not a peer to peer open source platform. You have to be invited and we work with professional sellers. So So it's not like eBay. It's not like eBay. It's more like professional brands, creators, influencers to professional retailers and resellers. Eventually we will expand that aperture and you'll be more like Depop or some of these other peer to peer platforms where a consumer could resell their closet, but that's years out. We're really focused on professional sellers. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of back to agenda. (laughs) This is like, Uh, look, I full circle. Some of the most powerful businesses in the world are marketplaces, right? They have compounding network effects, no pun intended. I was building marketplaces, just physical ones. I was building B2B marketplaces. Now I'm building a B2C marketplace and I'm building it online. It's just far more complicated, but I've been essentially my entire career, whether I realize it or not, bringing together communities of brands, of retailers, of consumers who are passionate about certain subcultures and allowing them to transact. First, it was a purchase order. Then a complex kind of became an individual purchase between a brand and a consumer. And I was also delivering them an experience and putting in an entertaining package and something that was curated. And I'm continually doing that. I'm just learning how to do it in different physical formats or digital formats and and scale it larger and expand my aperture of which communities that I'm serving. And that's been the history of what I've done for the last 25 years. It's really smart. Where's a category or a vertical that you wish you had that you don't have right now? There's a lot. Um, 60s muscle cars. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, cars are interesting. Honestly, I have spent most of my career working in mostly men's genres, meaning, you know, the action sports industry is very male dominated while there were some women's brands and skate and all these things. And have you been thinking about cars? I think about it all the time, but the reality of doing it is a whole other thing. Have you seen what Doug DeMuro did? Do you know who Doug is? No. So Doug DeMuro is this YouTuber. Oh, the guy with the high pitch voice. Yeah, he has a high pitch voice. Is he bring a trailer or he's... um, He's, he's cars and bids, cars and bids. Yes, yeah. I know this guy. I didn't know his name, but yeah. I love that guy. Doug is amazing. Like he's, he was originally from the East coast, I think Pennsylvania or somewhere like that. And he's like the least well-dressed guy. No offense, yes. Doug, but like, that's your shtick anyway. It's like, that's I think your he brand. dresses like that intentionally, right? I don't know. I think he <laughs> probably does now. Like he yeah. just keeps it casual, but like, he's like, he kind of like, has got like the new balance dad look with yeah. the cargo shorts, super wrinkly t-shirt hairs, like just whatever, yeah. rolled out of bed. But he's super enthusiastic about cars. He doesn't even know. He doesn't wrench on cars. I, I, I'm, you know, wait, I don't, I don't want to say that. He might wrench on cars, yeah. but you don't get that impression. He's like a best reviewer. Yeah. Yeah. But he's super enthusiastic. And then, you know, he moved to San Diego and then uh, his YouTube channel, it's almost, you know, like it's underproduced and yeah. it's grown like to from the zero. Turning like, Group just invested in his company at like a massive valuation. Yeah. $38 million, yeah. I think. Yeah. Look at him. Is there market? <laughs> so that's I'm curious, like if you thought about cars, yeah. he's, he's figured out how to do I, it. I haven't thought about cars. We thought about car culture. So we're doing a lot of stuff. How does, how does our platform is more about fashion and soft goods? So we do a lot of stuff in F1 type and like car enthusiast apparel brands. That's okay. a new emerging genre that I think is the next action sports. People who love cars and car culture and racing. So whether you're talking about F1, you're talking about NASCAR, yeah. you're talking about, you know, hot import nights, the more like that kind of stuff. There's, there's a whole brands that are really thematically what used to be the skate or the surf brand, I think is now becoming the car enthusiast brand. There's are a couple, you going to do the F1 in Vegas? I mean, yeah, you... we're doing a big thing there. Um, doing a big pop-up. So That's I'm really cool. excited about car culture, but not can't physically sell cars. Um, and then just generally women's audience is a huge opportunity for us. It's just a massive demographic that we don't cater to currently. So that's, you know, whatever, 60% of the population we're not touching. So I think in the future, we're going to expand into, you know, products and creators and brands that really expand our aperture again into the whole side. And whether it's just even selling women's sneakers, that's very adjacent, but there's a whole other things. Like the Barbie movie's hot right now, right? Mm -hmm. What, what, What collectibles, all these other things. We have men's collectibles and toys. What's over here is other stuff that appeal to women. Yeah. We just sat down with Viore, uh, Joe Kudla. Yeah. And like very successful brand. I mean, that thing's exploded. I tell you what, Joe's the real deal. Like I was, I was super impressed. There's a lot of these like direct to consumer, like t-shirt polo brands. Yeah. That, um, and there's like a handful of them that are like valued at like $200 million. Yeah. But they spend like 199 million on marketing. <laughs> I, I know some of those guys. Their margins yeah. are razor thin, right? Yeah. But not, not Viore. Like they're in Encinitas. They, you know, they tap Rob Machado. Yeah. Um, They're super like that. I'm a consumer of their product. Okay. And what do you like? What do you wear? Just like the t-shirts and the shorts. Yeah. I wear the joggers, the shorts. Yeah. I I was wearing the shorts this morning. I worked out like to me, and I don't know, I've seen the guy's ads and I'm super familiar, but I don't think that company's successful because of performance advertising. I've seen maybe they've been on television commercials. I know they raised a ton of money from SoftBank. 
if someone would have come to me like, oh, I'm going to create a you know, new athleisure brand, you know, with whatever, I would have said, Lululemon exists, Aloe exists, and they're like, don't do it, right? Like they would have just seemed like the market's crowded. But that to me really shows that there's always room for quality product. Because when I go in their store, what got me on is as I walked the shore, I felt the shirt. It's the I tried stuff on, I'm like, this is great fucking product, right? Yeah. This is better and differentiated than Lululemon. It's softer. It's more functional. I said, okay, like that shows that great product and quality can always break through no matter how uh, crowded the market is. And like that is to me what stands out about that one versus, you know, all these other ones where they do need to go spend a gazillion dollars on influencers and performance marketing. And, you know, they're spending 90% of their budget trying to make 10 cents. Right. So, and it's not special. Those brands are, you know, it's just like buying in the old days, you know, going back to sun sports, a lot of people use blanks and we, I remember, you know, commodity. People would sw- swap out the the labels in the hoodies and the t shirts, <laughs> yeah. and but it's the same shirt, it's the same blank, or it's the same you know whatever. Yeah, this is like cut and sew. This is special. It's great. Thinking more about the fabrics. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have thought I would have been their consumer, but I, I ended up being it just through the great products. Yeah, and so that's kind of what you're thinking on the women's side, right? You're looking for little diamonds in the rough like that. There's just tons of our business is very different. So like you know that Viore stuff like in fashion, that's all quality and function. We live in a world of Pop culture, passionate fandom collectors, so sneaker collectors, well, people buy Supreme. Curators, but curators of fan-driven communities. And when I sold my company Agenda, I sold those guys Reed Exhibition on this company, Reed Pop. They ran every major fan convention in the world. So like New York Comic Con, uh, PAX, biggest video game show in the world. We ended up running Complex Con. Those are all passionate, hyper-passionate groups yeah. of fans. Sub-cultures. And I learned a lot about... Yeah, subcultures of different fandoms. So I think we at Network are really catering to different collectors and crazy fanatical fans, whether those are sneaker collectors, whether those are streetwear collectors. And in the in women's, there could be people who collect Barbie dolls or collect Hello Kitty. There's all these other subcultures of a collector. So I think we cater a lot to collector culture and fanaticism, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad that you say that because we sort of were talking off camera that you never know who's listening. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and that person who's running... The, that business or thinking about that right now could be, you know, the next person that you, that reaches out to you. So absolutely. Yeah. I hope they do. (laughs) Well, I could talk to you for another six hours, but here we are at (laughs) one 30. Let's round third, come home and just bring it home. Um, Final words of advice. I mean, I had like 26 or seven different topics I want to talk about, but this was like perfect. (laughs) Uh, maybe we can call this part one, we'll do it again in three months, but, uh, maybe give us some, some final words of advice for people who are, um, trying to find their path, uh, running their startup, you know, trying to make it work. There's two, two, two versions of, I guess, advice that I would give. There's the advice that the untrained Aaron would give, which is what made me successful. And now there's the Aaron that is trying to become much, much more successful at a massive scale as I've learned. And sometimes I think there's a disadvantage to that, which I'll talk about. But in general, get out there and fucking try shit. Talk to people. Don't be scared. People just generally, and it's so overly, my advice might sound like repetitive to other people's advice, but like people are so fucking scared to fail. I was so unscared to fail because I didn't know because there's no repercussion to me. As long as you can stomach the repercussions, just get out there. Don't care what anyone thinks. Don't care about people telling you to F off, rejecting you, telling your idea sucks, whatever. Like just unrelentingly go out there and just push, 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 try, talk to people, present, pitch. I think generally, no matter what, even if you're a creative person, you're a technology, people are scared to be a salesman. I was never a salesman. I was a graphic designer, an introverted graphic designer, who liked graffiti, but I had to learn ultimately to become a salesman. So be your best salesman and get out there and just pitch constantly, not... 50 times, 100, thousands, tens of that. I probably made 10,000 unsuccessful sales pitches. And I mean that in the most literal sense. <laughs> I've had 10,000 people tell me to F off when I was trying to sell them a trade show booth or sell them a t-shirt or whatever. So like that is my biggest advice. And if you do that at enough shotgun iteration and scale, you will be successful at whatever it is you're doing. On the other side, what I've learned now, scaling businesses and, and scaling teams, and some of the stuff I knew inherently by doing, because I was hyper passionate, I was doing the the original ideation of what your idea is and the clarity of vision and the focus of what you're doing that that initial idea um has to be so clear so when as you you finally catch on to something and then you need to bring other people in your orbit it's not just you doing right or you and two people in a room doing everyone understands as i try to scale an organization past 50 people past 150 people 200 plus people 
that mission vision stuff that people talk about sounds a little corporate is so important that it's not just like you writing it because someone told you to write it. You really get it. And you can, you know, it's like that stuff they talk about. If you go to SpaceX and you ask the janitor what they're doing, they say, oh, we're trying to, you know, put human life on Mars because we want to be a multi-planetary species. Like, you know, he's not cleaning the bathroom. He's contributing to that greater mission vision. That stuff is so important. I think literally until this year, I did not understand that because I was always doing things that were sub 50 people or sub this. And as you really want to get something, that's going to be great. The best companies in the world, you literally can walk in and ask the janitor, ask them what they're doing. And like, I'm still at the point where I'm learning how to do that and learning how to scale teams and transcend my ideas beyond my own personal might and my own personal hustle. How do I get 500 people pointed in the same direction when I'm sleeping? And that's the shit that's like, how do you take this from this to, to becoming a massive global company? And, you know, again, hopefully you can do the hustle to get here, but then once you get here, you really got to learn how to scale and how to transition the ideology and the passion and the focus and the, and the clear idea to, to, you know, whatever, hundred plus people. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> Brian from the action sports network here with the uh, P rod. What's up, dude? Oh, nothing, man. Just hanging out here at agenda. How you doing? I'm doing good. I was surprised. I was down at the Nike booth to see the uh, your shoe out so fast. Yeah, my fourth shoe. Well, it'll be out in August. We're showing it's pretty pretty early, but it'll be out in August. The whole clothing line, everything drops August. PR by Nike SB. So there's like a high top and a low top? Yeah, we got the high top, which is more kind of like the stylish, still skatable version. And then the low top, which we stripped down every unnecessary thing and made it strictly just light and skatable your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you backseat drivers got nothing but two cents shotgun riders too biased they all liars i should get an a for effort i'm too tired but i'm never giving up that's why i'm kind of admired role model like it or not i gotta play it sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes but still say it said i was quitting at 40 is just a fib i'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib you ever wanted something so bad that you could Tasted, yeah. cried yeah. over every opportunity wasted. Yeah. Good and bad news, which one you want first? Either, Either way, you pick the bad, still gonna hurt you the worst. I never got the bask in the fruits of the label, uh-uh. and I never got the cash from that dude from the label. No. I'm just thinking back. Can we go way back? Way back? Way back? Way back? Can we go way back? Retrospect, I would have did it the same. Uh-huh. In hindsight, I'm the only one to blame. <laughs> I ain't picky, I'm just real specific. I want nothing less than terrific. I know y'all get it. I'm aggressive, so our style is clashing. Killer instinct.